The dollar war path. Solving inflation is not a quick fix. Investors and the United States Federal Reserve are finding this out in real time. Participants who were hoping for a deceleration inflation this month were met with a surprise this week. Inflation remains stubbornly above 8%, and this paves the way for additional interest rate increases. It's becoming the norm in Jerome Powell's toolkit right now. The chart you're looking at right now shows the United States inflation measures going back to January 1970. You can see where the CPI peaks were in March 1980 and uh, December of 1980. And now you look at the possible CPI inflection points in real time. Sadly, no slowdown at inflation station. Participants were hoping for a slowdown in inflation which in turn could lead to a smaller rate increase at the November Fed meeting. This would create a, you know, some support for equities and lead to a weakening of the US dollar, you would think, at least in theory. However, the early 1980s, which is the last time we had a serious inflation saga, and this was actually just the beginning of a 100% rise in the value of the US dollar versus all major currency pairs at that time in the 80s. Don't believe me? Look at the chart right now. That's the US dollar index. At peak inflation, which is circled just around January 1980 to December 1980, you look at the US dollar rise over the next few years, over 100%. And you look what's going on right now. The US dollar rise is just starting. History rhymes. What should you do? This goes against 100% of what you are led to believe in the day-to-day -day headlines, where most pundits and talking heads in the peanut gallery suggest that slowing inflation leads to a weakening dollar. Now, why did the dollar rip during the 1980 to 1985 period? Two reasons. Tightening monetary policy. Remember the big man, Fed Chairman Volcker, aggressively raised interest rates for two years. Expansive fiscal policy. Government spending under the President Ronald Reagan at the time spent more money than it generated from tax receipts. The trigger effect of the government spending aggressively resulted to stimulate growth. Combined with high interest rates led to massive demand for the US dollar and it sent soaring relative to the other nation's currencies. Does this sound at all familiar to you today? Right now we have a US Federal Reserve which is hell bent on reigning in inflation conducting the fastest increase policy rates in decades and combined with a democratic government with aggressive expansive fiscal policy from President Biden. Buckle up. The meeting in New York that changed America. So what led to the cratering of the dollar in 1985? It was called the Plaza Accord. It was a summit in New York City attended by the most important central bankers and government officials of that time. Well, what countries were there? United States, France, Germany, Japan, United Kingdom. Remember, China was not yet a major player and the USSR was falling apart. During the summit, the officials enacted the ability to conduct coordinated central bank intervention. And they agreed amongst themselves to lower the dollar by 10 to 12% over the coming six weeks. Now, why would the US vote in favor to devalue its own currency? Officials at the time believed that the expensive U.S. dollar would lead to less competitive American industries and could trigger mass unemployment. Remember, gung-ho was in full throttle when Japan was defeating the American manufacturing machine. Again, does that remind you of something? The key underlying challenge in the United States was a simple issue of capital mobility. At the time, the world was not nearly as well connected as it is today. Globalization wasn't yet a thing back in the early 80s. Today, capital can move from regions of low return potential to regions providing higher potential returns on capital with ease. Capital mobility plays an integral role and is a key reason why I believe the United States and the US dollar are not set up for a massive crash like others suggest. No matter how you shake the tree, it is truly difficult to see a world where the US dollar doesn't retain its world reserve status and remain strong against its other currency peer group. We must remember, 
we are in the very early innings of a major attempt by central banks and governments to deleverage. Deleveraging means taking money out of the system, which is a situation we haven't experienced in decades. Some countries haven't even started yet. The U.S. is leading the pack and is the strongest economy in the world. It makes total sense that they go first. Don't get me wrong. There are massive structural issues to be sorted out in the United States, but there are even more structural issues abroad. Just jump on a plane and go see the rest of the world. Do the U.S. have an energy crisis right now? No. I know you think they might, but in reality, if you compare it to other nations, are industries and citizens forced to pay 10 times their average utility bill every month today? No, the Americans are not. Is there a massive lending crisis going on? Is a household debt to disposable income at all-time highs? Again, in the U.S., the answer remains no. In other jurisdictions, it is. Now, that does not mean this is a one-way trade. There will absolutely be bumps in the road as investors attract by short-term returns flock to other currencies. However, over a much longer period, I believe the U.S. dollar will remain a stalwart for the global economy, and it will be in my own portfolio. As interest rates go up, expect further declines in the equity prices of most publicly listed companies. Now, the share price is one thing, but the global economy is another. Same old song and dance. In the aftermath of the vocal inflation era, Reagan's stimulus and the Plaza Accord, commodities took an absolute beating. The commodities index measured by the Bloomberg fell over 50% from 1981 through 1986, only to appreciate nearly 100% over the coming decade. It was a choppy ride, however, filled with many months with minimal returns and a few high return months scattered in. As you can see the chart right now, the commodity market didn't truly begin trending again upwards until after the tech bubble burst in early 2000s. This is why one of my boldest ideas, detailed in full to my subscribers, is actually based on a soft commodity market. If my investment thesis can reward me well in a lousy market when commodity prices do trend strongly higher, it should perform exceptionally well. This is the same thesis I posted to my subscribers in 2018 and 2019 in Uranium. And many years later, it was a massive success. Now for all the regulators, past performance does not mean future success, but my own money is here. If you followed me for some time, you know that I eat my own cooking. You'll also know that a key part of my two decade success as a professional investor in the natural resource space is that I'm rarely part of the herd mentality. The investment ideas found within the KRO, which stands for the Katusa Resource Opportunities, are unconventional. If you want a newsletter to feed your confirmation bias, I am not the person for you and my newsletter is not for you. I challenge myself continuously to come up with the best ideas that no one else is writing about. Stay safe. Subscribe to the KRO, which is a Katusa Resource Opportunities, to find out exactly what prices I'm buying at and what price I sell at before the trade occurs. And you get to sell before I do. If you want to give your portfolio an edge, consider becoming a member and giving it a try for yourself.